here and now, here we are. This is the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund Vanguard Circle, and we uh, have uh, we're meeting to discuss anti-Semitism in Palestine. To lead off, the uh, film director who won the big award in Berlin or wherever made the most stupid remark, saying that he was refusing his Jewishness. You know, because he thinks that this is, you know, like the thing to say, you know, because he thinks that if he's going to go anti-Zionist, that he has to refuse his Jewishness. That's what he starts off with. You know, like who has been advising this idiot? Let him stick to film, you know, like in politics, you know, he has no idea what he's doing. It, there's like Professor Shlomo Sand, who has a position teaching and teaches the most stupid things, you know, like that the Ashkenazi Jewish people are not Jewish, that they come from Kazakhstan. And that he's no longer Jewish, you know, he decided that he's no longer Jewish. And he wrote a book about it. And everybody buys the book and he makes some money, you know, and, and then France, you know, the French people, they love this, you know, because everybody's supposed to be French and not anything else. <laughs> and the Jewish people even adopt, you know, a Christian first name. And I knew uh, a Jewish woman communist who was actually doing volunteer work for you know, the local Catholic church. This is, you know... <laughs> The kind of mentality that this you know idea comes from that you have to refuse your jewishness in order to declare yourself to be opposed to the genocide in gaza it really makes me angry you know and it corresponds you know a lot to the uh the classical you know marxist uh an 1848 pamphlet on the jewish question in which karl marx who was raised a lutheran actually you know argues that the uh, problem with anti-Semitism is the Jewish people's own fault and they should just stop being Jewish and then they won't be as discriminated against. Basically, that's his argument. Uh, if you think I'm being harsh on Karl Marx, you know, let me know. Uh, no, that's no. One of the, uh, on, that's one of the honest critiques of Karl Marx that, uh, like, I, I, I hear a lot of critiques of Karl Marx, but that's honestly one of the good critiques. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think there's any way around it. Um, I, I would say, um, I'm not, I'm not saying that he deliberately did this, but the one I remember that pushed that, that if you're going to really be Jewish and be for Palestine, you have to drop Jewishness. The one that I remember being the most prevalent saying that was Rich Siegel. And he had been very convincing for a long time. Um, eventually a lot of Muslims caught on to this and they got very uncomfortable. Like Muslims, when I was active on Facebook, I'd get messages from Muslims like, yeah, you're right. He's extremely like messed up about this. Hmm. Yeah. It's uh, Professor Shlomo San, Gilad Altsman, the fascist as well. I mean, he starts by refusing his Jewishness and ends up, you know, being a fascist. Okay. So uh, who else is like this? So many, you know, here, that's why they don't show up to the vigil, you know, on Sunday at the Jewish community campus, because they don't want to be Jewish, even though they call themselves Jewish. You know? my, grand, my grandfather, who is an Ashkenazi Jew, I told him about some of the uh, anti-Semitism that I face for my community. And he said, well, just don't let them know you're Jewish. And I feel like I shouldn't have to hide being Jewish. Yeah. And it doesn't work anyway. <laughs> you know, like it didn't work in, uh, in Spain in 1492 when a, a large segment of the Jewish population converted to Catholicism. And they were still killed and exiled. Germany, the Jewish uh, German population, were as German as German, as as German you can get. You know, didn't even speak Yiddish, only German, and they looked down upon Jewish people who spoke Yiddish. Hmm? They were dealt with as well as Jewish people, even though they were trying to deny it. You know, it doesn't work. You know, that's the easy answer to that. Uh, you know, and the and the assimilationists, you know, of either Marxist or liberal quality, you know, are. Just voicing a cliche. They don't know what they're talking about. A fun fact here. Um, there is an extremely high similarity of DNA between Ashkenazim and Palestinians. In paternal it's DNA. Um, In paternal DNA, yes. Yeah, but it's there. It's yes. there. Though. In fact, it's more there than from somebody like me who's Sephardi. In fact, I mean, this is why I say I, I, I'm very doubtful when people say, well, Sephardim are more... Hebrew than Ashkenazi. That's not what the evidence has ever shown me. Um, Mizrahim, yes, but people forget Sephardim are always the most mixed, the most mixed of everybody. Yeah. You know, um, we do have a lot of times we're intermarried with Ashkenazim, and a lot of times we're married with uh, Mizrahim, with Arabs, with you know, um, 
with um, uh, uh, different Mediterraneans. In fact, I would say majority of us are Mediterranean. I believe mm -hmm. personally that what my family said about us was 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 just family folklore because the more I tried to look into my family, I think that we were we are the descendants of my family that we are the descendants of Visigoth converts, which that doesn't take away any credibility because there's no ethnic part of being Jewish. There's nothing ethnic about being Jewish. You People mean are, racial? There's, it's not a racial category. Well, it, it's, it's not, not a biological category. category. It's not even really an ethnic category. What it is is there's ethnic categories that are predominantly Jewish because we weren't really allowed to con convert people. People who came to convert had to do so secretly or like, you know, and instantly they had to change their names because, you know, it was problematic, not just from the Christian point of view, but even the Muslim point of view. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the Muslims like you can't spread Christianity and, and Judaism. That was their policy. Uh, that's the part of the whole Dimi law. Uh -huh. uh, Andrew. Um, I'd be very interesting to hear you record uh, some of the instances, the incidents of anti-Semitism that you've uh, thought of, because uh, people should know what happens. Because you know, it's 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 a deny. You know, it's a deny. It's a denial. You know, like uh, so many uh, non-Jews are in denial. You know, of anti-Semitism, and even you know the, uh, the the Jewish assimilationists. You know, they don't believe that anti-Semitism still exists. Well, the uh, the person I was who said it to me, well, they said, first of all, they said that, they said, quote, and, and I quote, fuck you, kike, you're what's wrong with this country. Hmm. The whole country, oh, well, boy, you know, like 1.5% of the population has that much influence in the country? Really? Huh. If we if we had influence, uh, uh, Tukun Olam would be taken as a global mission, that that would be the case. So, like, I, I, find, I find this, like, too fantastic to... Uh, that's just yeah i mean um, we try to have you know an influence you know whether for socialism or 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 some you know in in order to make make a stash of money but you know there's not that many jewish people around you know like it doesn't make that much of a difference you know uh on our own so uh for somebody to say something like that to you you know like is a, a delusionary Amy, hey, do you have those figures? Because you had those figures about uh, um, they're accurate too. You had the actual figure. I mean, I knew it about this, but you had the actual percentage of how um, like the financiers in the United States is German and English. Actually, you had the actual figures to this demographic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Twenty-one percent of the uh, American population is of uh, Anglo origin, Anglo-Saxon, New England, you know, and all that sort of thing. And uh, surprisingly, twenty percent. Are German Americans, you know, those who were unemployed came from Germany or were seeking to get away, you know, from uh, the feudal system there, and coming to America, they expected to get free land out in the West, and the New Englanders, you know, didn't want to leave their cushy uh, cities, you know, in the East, and so all these German Americans went out west, you know, took uh, the lands away from the First Nations and set up all those states that are now predominantly German American, and are now also predominantly red states in the uh, American electoral system as well. Now, uh, the uh, black nation of uh, in in amongst Americans is, uh, I believe, it's seventeen uh, percent, which is less than the uh, 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 Mexica population, Spanish-speaking population, which is twenty-one percent, and then that's eleven percent, and then. Uh, uh, the uh, First Nations are like two and a half percent, and the Jewish people are like one and a half percent. So I think that uh, all adds up to about a hundred percent. I think that's pretty very, accurate. We have a very high percentage of Machica and uh, Mestizo Mexican in Arizona, like a very high population of them, and they're actually um, very friendly to Jewish people. Um, I mean, when you when you tell them you're they're, you, uh, you're Jewish, they don't ask anti-Semitic questions. They ask actual questions about your culture and your history and your religion. They they get very interested very quickly, and uh -huh. um, it works for me because uh, they were colonized to speak Spanish, so like I can learn Spanish from them, which makes it easier to learn Ladino. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, what's another example, Andrew, of uh, anti-Semitic comments that you've heard that you've been subjected to? Well, I don't have many examples of anti-Semitic comments, but when I wore my kippah, uh, so many people around town stare at me like I'm some kind of spectacle. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
That, that's yeah, why I can't when, wear I, mine anymore. when I was growing up in Toronto, we were told not to wear our kippas, that it was dangerous. My mother told me, don't go east of Bathurst Street because you'll get beaten up by the Goyam. <laughs> so I never did. <laughs> and she's probably right. I did get beaten one time by a, by a, a Christian guy just because I was talking to his brother. Yeah. I recently learned that uh not I'm not saying Christianity is the only source of anti-Semitism, but it is a major source of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. The most predominant as well. Yeah. There's also the influence of the German Americans, you know, because even the American word Jew, it's an American word, you know, in, in terms of being used as an as a normal word. But in Germany, the word Jew was an anti-Semitic word in the German language. And it was on the yellow star written uh, Yid, Y-I-D, Yid, which means translated as Jew. You know, <laughs> uh, in German, you know, Yid means Jew. Yiddish means Jewish in German and Yiddish. But Yid, you know, is an insult. And yet, you know, it's common, you know, parlance in, in American political culture. It amazes me. And it's gone everywhere else as well. You know, like I can't, I can't tolerate that sort of thing. It's, you know, considered to be normal, you know, to be anti-Semitic in effect. I, I say Jew and Jews a lot because it's just how uh, I'm, I'm more comfortable with it, with, with, with just the vernacular. But it's weird because as time has gone by, the more I've been invested in Buddhism, it's like, you know, it is messed up that that's how we refer to ourselves because in all honesty, Jew is not correct. It's Jewish. And Jews mm -hmm. is not even correct because that's plural to Jew. It would be Jewish people or Jewry. And so yeah. that's the funny thing. We actually have English words for this that we are not typically using. Hmm. Yeah, because the German word has taken over. Also, in the the American sort of a vernacular, you know, instead of saying yes, you know, Americans say yeah. Guess where that comes from? It comes yeah. from yeah, yeah in German. Yeah means yes in German. Right. In Yiddish, it's yo. In, in the Swiss German, it's yo as well. But in German German, it's ya. Yeah. And it turned into ya yeah in American language. In Hebrew, it's Ken, I believe. Yeah. It's what? Ken. I see. Yeah, Ken means yes. And uh, and in uh, Arabic, it's nam. Yeah. Anyway, so... Still, you know, there's this whole layer, even though there's this layer of Jewish people who are, you know, in the solidarity movement of the Palestinians, they're like the old layer. And they still think that you have to deny Jewishness in order to be anti-Zionist. And they only say that they're Jewish in order to have a position from which to um, make a statement that is regarded with some credibility. Some okay. people even use the word Zionist and Jewish interchangeably. Yeah, that itself is anti-Semitism to do that. Uh, the uh, definitely. When I was very active on Facebook, the biggest goal I had was to show that the fact that the Talmud is intrinsically anti-Zionist because it was always blamed for Zionism. When no, if you get into it, Karaites, those are the Jewish people that reject the Talmud. They are almost always Zionist because while if you really read the Jewish scriptures, there's not really an excuse for Zionism, but it's easier to twist that. When you get in the Talmud, it becomes impossible to do that. It becomes literally impossible. Like, Good. You know, the, the Talmud that needs to clarify all that, you know, because there has to be further clarification. Because on the one hand, you have the prophet Samuel, which said that we are not a nation like other nations. We should not have a king. In other words, we should not have a state. Okay. Which is the you know the what it's like you know like with Moses when we had a an, uh, a national assembly you know once a year in which all the uh, delegates you know from all the tribes came together and uh, discussed things and it was like a constitutional assembly and but there was no state and there was no king you know with Moses so you know that I think is preferable you know to uh, you know having a king as as in the opinion of of the prophet Samuel but when you come to Ezekiel or Yechaskel, as he's called in Hebrew, he's all in favor of a state, you know. He says, oh, a state is necessary because they will come and kill us, you know. Uh, and every generation they will come and seek, you know, another generation will come and seek to annihilate us. And he says this is inevitable, and we need a state to defend ourselves with, and that there's no other choice. 
You know, so the so Yechesco and Samuel are completely opposite in each other, you know, in very fundamental questions as to what the nature of the Jewish people is or should be. And yet this is not discussed. You know, that's why I like the Talmud so much, because the Talmud completely reinterprets that as not a state. And it, it like you get in the Talmudic lore, a Jewish king wouldn't be a monarch. He'd be a lot more like a Rebbe that people would be drawn to. And so that means this would only apply in a supernatural context, which is the only context I believe it in. Which also means that for those of us who don't believe in the supernatural, you, you just have to drop the whole thing, which is also okay. You know, um, there there is no through the final complications of Jewish law, there's no excuse actually for monarchs because kings become concepts more like uh, they become more like chiefs or or designated leaders that people are drawn to. In fact, king and chief in in the Jewish consciousness is supposed to be interchangeable, the very concept. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad you told me uh, that you know how to say in Hebrew, uh, "Hamadinat Yelo Yisrael." It's "Hamadinat so, Velo Yisrael." It's the, it's hey, the, bob, ah, the bob, "Hamadinat the bob. Velo Yisrael." Mm. Yes. So it's whenever the, the Zionists shout at me, you know, like uh, "I'm Yisrael Chai," I can now shout back at them, "I'm Yisrael Chai," "Hamadinat Yelo Yisrael." You gotta remember, have to ve, think. Is, remember it's the vav, the vav because, because the vav can be and of or pertaining to this or um you know like vav is a very interesting letter in hebrew because it, it can have more than one meaning because this, the symbol means a nail so it connects it's a connective oh. word a connective oh. letter and oh. ha in hebrew is just one letter the hey you know oh. and the if you think about it the which is hey also means behold in fact, the yeah. if you think about the very article, the it does mean behold, like uh -huh. um the 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 prophet or behold prophet. You know, if you actually start to think of it in that, you know, like I'm not necessarily an expert in Hebrew, but I've studied enough Hebrew that I'm like it's very interesting how Hebrew projects concepts. You mm -hmm. know, and it, it's so obvious it was never meant to be a, a a common use language. It was always meant to be liturgical. Like even the even rabbis, you know, would debate about this, and the majority of rabbis would say. No, we always spoke Hebrew. We always spoke Hebrew because those no, no, sorry, we always spoke Aramaic. That like the majority of them in the debates mm. would come up with all this proofs that we always spoke Aramaic. Hebrew was designated as a holy language and uh -huh. only a holy language. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm. I heard that in a lot of ways, uh modern Hebrew is kind of the constructed language. Yeah, it's just uh, American, you know, spelt with Hebrew letters, basically, you know, 30%. 70% of the Hebrew spoken there now is the same as the uh, Arabic vocabulary. And yes. the Arabs know it, but the but the Israelis don't. Well, I mean, okay, so he, Yehudi is both Hebrew and Arabic for Jewish. Yes. The Muslims actually, like, it's funny because when you, when you, when you get into, like, Greek, Greek is very beautiful, but Greek does not make distinctions, for instance, between Judean and Jewish. In Hebrew, there are distinctions between Jewish and Judean. Like Yehudan, yes. it's it's not in a lot of texts. It's and I and I I do blame this on the Zionists because a lot of literature I've been looking for is gone now because Zionists actually, after 1948, went out of their way to destroy Yemenite literature, Moroccan literature because of these very things that you know a distinction was made of what is Yehudi. These barbarians, you know, who destroy you know books. They're doing the same thing in Gaza now. They just destroyed the libraries of a number of universities. Well, you know. Wouldn't be the first time fascists destroyed books. You yeah. also know the state of Israel does not care about the actual churches. They only care about the West catering to the Western churches. They're genociding the Oriental churches with the yeah. Muslims. And yeah. I think that a lot of that is because, okay, yeah, we, we don't always agree with the oriental churches but we have a, we've had a much better relationship with them we've always had a much better relationship with the greek orthodox with the coptics with the ethiopians you know the syriac we always had a much better relationship with them they also had a better relationship with the muslims i think what destroyed their relationship with the muslims was the rise of nationalism that came from europe because before that the christians and the muslims you know um got along a lot better in those areas of the world yeah, well, before the Crusades, that, that is to say. I remember this past October, the Israeli occupation forces destroyed a Orthodox church in Gaza. Huh. 
they destroyed the oldest one in existence actually that was there like they and they destroyed the i think it's the old uh, the uh, the uh, the i forget which which mosque it was which mosque it was but they destroyed one of the oldest mosques over there also mm -hmm. um so the, these things that have always been there are gone now mm -hmm. you know and I, I i've said before um and i think I, I wish just others would pick this up we should build we should actually start to build projects to rebuild those 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 parishes and cathedrals and the mosques uh, you know the, the the christian and and muslim buildings need to be rebuilt over there they should they will be, rebuilt. be they will be yeah yeah i the, feel uh, like palestine is on i'm sorry go ahead uh, the palestinian ambassador to england he was speaking and he said just that that they they promised to rebuild it i feel like palestine will eventually win this one way or another yeah I mean, even the U.S. is calling for the recognition of a Palestine state now. I would and never if Israel say... continues, uh, the International Court of Justice will recommend that Israel be suspended from the uh, General Assembly as well. So it could be complete reversal, co complete flip-flop on Israel. I, I would never say that Palestinian peoples should mandatory have to go back to Palestine, but I, I would want to encourage it because with the loss of numbers... I think that 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 the, the uh, I I forget what it's called, but it's it has to do with the key. You know what I'm talking about, the key. I think yeah. that there should be like banners with that key because because Palestinians going back to Palestine could help repopulate. Because I I don't want to see Palestine destroyed. I don't want to see it removed. That that is in fact where the three Abrahamic religions get along the best. It is the primary mm -hmm. example, you know, for that piece. But you know, there's all this catering towards Western Protestant power. From the state of Israel. In fact, Netanyahu, he doesn't speak of Jewish prophecies. He particularly picks evangelical prophecies, not even Catholic ones, because the Catholics are kind of a lot of Catholics are embarrassed by by the Crusades, and so he goes. He particularly goes after those evangelical, Pentecostal and Baptist, you know, um, white power Christians. He particularly like uses their version their version of what they think Isaiah means. You know, he doesn't actually like go by what the Jewish. Yes. OK, we don't have to get into all the details, you know, but it reminds me of this, you know, one uh, Zionist who was uh, talking to me or confronting me, you know, on Sunday, who the one who was in the uh, yeshiva for 15 years and who had the uh, uh, metal shrapnel from the Iron Dome system falling on the roof of his yeshiva. You know, uh, I, you know, he was saying, saying you know, that that uh, that the land, you know, belongs exclusively to the Jewish people, only to. Uh, Isaac and not Ishmael. And he kept on repeating that. Isaac and not Ishmael. Isaac and not Ishmael. So I said to him, that's not what it says in the Torah. Excuse me. First of all, it says all the descendants of Abraham and in the land of Canaan. He says, no, 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 no. It doesn't say that. No, no, no it doesn't say <laughs> And he's supposed to be a Shiva Bukhar. I've been, re I've been recommended this page and I know this is kind of a side tangent, but Facebook keeps recommending me this page called Jewish, like something as a something along the lines of Jewish people are the only uh, indigenous people to the land of Israel. This is the Protestant argument. Yes, they're saying that there was no Palestinians before. They forget about Canaan. And then they say that it, all, it belongs exclusively to the Jewish people. And therefore, the Jewish people should be supporting them as well. <laughs> So, you know, like, in effect, they're converting them into being Protestants. That's what Zionism are. Zionists, to me, are just converts to Protestantism, you know, as a facade of, of Judaism. Because they're told that's where they belong, that they should go back there, and that that's going to uh, 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 ignite, you know, the return of their Messiah, their God. Yes. Funny no, enough. I'll go ahead. Don't, don't go ahead. I've spoken too much. Go ahead. Well, I'm not a Christian, but there is a line in Revelation in which it says uh, something about a synagogue of Satan, and I associate that with Zionists. Uh, well, one could, but in uh, John, it refers to all the Jewish people as the children of Satan. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a trope, true. you know, it's, that's used by... Um, by both about all the Christian uh, Western sects, you know, to denigrate the Jewish people. I uh, I think the best take, by the way, that verse. I know what verse you're talking about because I I actually studied Christianity. In John, 
Uh, no, no, though he's referring to that thing in Revelation. Um, if you want to know what the Christian Socialist Front says, they actually say that that's the Jews for Jesus. I like that much better. Yeah. Yeah, because if you, because if you well, think I don't about understand it, what did you say, Net? Okay, this uh, group the, said something about. Okay. Um, the the Christian Socialist Front actually uh, has maintained more than once that that reference he's referring to in the Book of Revelation actually refers to um things like Jews for Jesus. Oh. that that would be the synagogue of Satan. I like that interpretation a lot better. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, well. if you think about it, Messianic Judaism or Jews for Jesus is an insult to both Judaism and Christianity. Uh, yeah, yes. I agree. Yes, but the, the reference to Satan, you know, is very problematic. It's uh, it's what was used, you know, to denigrate the Jewish people as a whole to begin with, you know. So to yeah. continue using that. Um, Terminology to me is problematic because it's associated I, I with the initial that. sort of use. I'm I sorry think... about that. But uh, I think anti-Semitism is going to be a much bigger problem, you know, with the advent of the Trump uh, presidency, who uh, legitimatizes anti-Semitism, even though he's very pro-Zionist. And we're going to see uh, a lot more of that happening. I've, Zionism and anti-Semitism are not mutually exclusive either. Precisely. Yeah. Example is in Trump. Yeah. Okay, so and then we have that problem of anti-Semitism and then we have the problem of anti-Semitism amongst the assimilated Jewish uh, milieu who are playing politics with Judaism, with, with the Jewish people now, you know, and, and speaking out in the name of the Jewish people. I mean, like independent Jewish voices in Canada. In the United States, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, are much more principled. And uh, if not now, is, is uh, I think, quite close to Mundism as well. Um, a member of the Jewish Voice for Peace was recently killed by the San Bernardino Police Force. Really? I didn't hear about that. Yes. Under what circumstances? How did that happen? I'm not honestly too sure, but he was an African American Jew, and uh, he he was uh, he was gunned down, gunned down. I mean, uh huh, wow, by the police. Yes. Hmm. My my. Okay, I guess uh, we should take uh, a chance to uh, conclude here, and then we've got ourselves another uh, broadcast. And so we're making headway. And next time, uh, perhaps we can invite um, Abraham Schultz from Mexico City as well. He's an that organizer would be there. Cool. That would be yeah, he's, to have uh, him on here would be great. Yeah, he uh, initiated the uh, Facebook group called uh, Jewish Not Zionist. And uh, gonna, it has uh, 7,500 subscribers. You, you know, I've never actually spoken to him over the phone. I used to just know him through Facebook. If that have him here would be like, like a, that'd be amazing. Breakthrough, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Very good. I'm I'm down for that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So uh so our voice is still small, but it's strong and it's being heard. So I think that we have a way to approach the Jewish community that nobody else does, because uh the other Jewish organizations, even Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, are protesting from the outside and not from the inside. They should be going inside the Jewish American Congress or calling for a plenary session of the Jewish American Congress to decide, you know, that we have to denounce the genocide being perpetuated in Gaza, stuff like that, from the inside, okay? I mean, going down to the APEC conference and shutting down the front door, you know, like is fine. That's APEC. But when it comes to the Jewish community, we have to have a different strategic approach. We have to go beyond the anti-Semitism of the assimilated Jewish population, which are speaking out as Jewish now for the first time in their lives. And we have to speak to the Jewish people as Jewish people with Jewish concerns that put us in solidarity with the Palestinians and explain to them that they are setting up the Jewish people for a big fall. And that fall is anti-Semitism that's coming down the tubes, both from the populist left and from the populist right. I'm sorry to say so, 
But that's what I conclude. I agree. I honestly see a lot of possibility for uh, even left wing communists, or even like not left, not left communists, but like left wing people as well as some communists to be anti Semitic. Because I see it from my Facebook friends, even. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I see it from the Jewish Marxists in France, you know. Shlomo Sands and this uh, director guy in Berlin and uh, Zaltzman in England, you know, they're all declare themselves to be anti-Jewish. And they say that, that it's necessary to do so in order to be anti-Zionist. I mean, beside being stupid, it's well, also, you know, uh, self-contradictory, you know, because I, I, nobody believes that, you know, for real. They like the words, you know, perhaps, you know, if they're into it, but, you know, it's not real. A good way to help uh, with 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 the problem you're seeing with with the communists is we should continue to uplift the the, the Maoist Bundists and the anarcho Bundists because they're a thing now. Yeah. Okay, great guys. Okay, until next time. That was good. See you.